Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And, and that is probably the best introduction I've ever had, so I might have to pinch that for all my talks. Um, yeah, my name's Dr. Anna Mach, and I'm based at the University of Oxford. And I've been studying fathers uh, for the last 10 years, looking at it from an evolutionary standpoint, so why and when fatherhood evolved in our line, and then trying to work out what adaptations evolution has given men to, to help them, to prime them to parent. And also, as an anthropologist, looked at fatherhood around the world. So we get an idea of how men in different countries countries do that. But what's really interesting, and in those last 10 years, is I've learned a lot about what it is to be a father, but dads still believe the same thing, and it's this, that mothers instinctively know how to parent. Because they go through the processes of pregnancy and childbirth, they kind of go through this magical transformation where they instinctively know what their baby needs. But they believe that fathers have to learn to parent. And because they have this belief, it, it undermines their feelings of competency. It makes them feel a little bit like they're the secondary parent, there to make the tea or carry the bag. And it also reflects the ideas we have in society about what fathers are to both ourselves within our families and to society at large. But you see, this, this belief system, this idea that mothering is instinctive and fathers have to read books and learn what they're doing and look up to mum as the gold standard of parenting, well, I find that a little difficult to cope with. In the first instance, I find it difficult for a personal reason. And that reason is I have two daughters, and I can tell you, I think for the first week after my daughter was born 12 years ago, I don't think I cleaned my teeth. I literally, every day, woke up and thought, I'm going to clean my teeth today. But because there was so much to learn, I had to work out what each of her cries were. I had to become very good at changing nappies. And I had to juggle together all the equipment it needs just to get out the front door. I certainly was not an instinctive parent. Maybe it's just me, but I don't think it is. There was a lot to learn. And secondly, as an anthropologist and somebody who studies the evolution of the human species, I struggle for the, with this for this reason. And that is that human fathers are really, really rare. If we look at our, our mammalian kingdom, only 5% of mammalian species have investing fathers. That's fathers who stick around after the act of conception itself, who are there to protect and provide and to care for those offspring in many different ways. And when we think about why this evolved in the human line, and not, for example, in our fellow apes, none of the other apes uh, have investing fathers, it's due largely because of the quirks of our anatomy, the fact that we're bipedal, and we walk on two legs, but also we've got these enormous brains. They are six times bigger than they should be for a mammal of our size. Now, when this first started happening, this problem between big brain and, and bipedality about 1.8 million years ago, obviously the issue was the baby could not fit through the birth canal without significant risk to mum and to child. So at that point, evolution selected an adaptation, which meant we birthed our babies far too early. They really should be in there for a good six months longer than they actually are. And therefore, when they're born, they're incredibly useless. As anybody who, who's looked after a newborn baby knows, they don't really do very much. They're not that interesting. So we couldn't look after them on, us, on our own as women. So we started cooperating with each other. And until about half a million years ago, that was going really, really well. We were getting help from our aunts, from our sisters, from our elder daughters, from the grandmothers to help us raise these really, really useless babies. However, about half a million years ago, our brains got even bigger and suddenly that was not enough help. We needed somebody else to step in. And at that point, human fathers came onto the scene because it, was, it became very, very clear that their genes would not be passing on down those generations, which is, let's face it, the whole point of existence, unless they stepped in and they started providing and protecting for that child. And that's the state we're at today, where we still have investing fathers. But this leads me to two conclusions about the evolution of fatherhood half a million years ago. And the first is this. As somebody who studies evolution, I know it does not leave things to chance. It does not select for a particular adaptation or a particular role in society without then trying to prepare that person to do a good job. It's not going to send those dads half a million years ago out into the savannah and go, you're on your own, you, can, you got this. No, it's going to try and evolve a set of adaptations to prime that man to be good at fatherhood, to give him and his offspring the best chance of survival. <gasps> so when I began 10 years ago, one of the things I wanted to look at was what those adaptations were. What happens to a man 
physiologically, biologically, neurologically, to actually prime him in the same way as it does women to actually become good parents. And the biggest thing that we've discovered in the last 10 years, not only at Oxford, but around the world, is this, is that men also go through hormonal changes when they become a father for the first time. And the real biggie, and the one that sometimes makes men groan, is the fact that your testosterone drops when you become a father for the first time, and I'm afraid it never returns to pre-fatherhood levels. Now, testosterone is a wonderful, wonderful hormone. It makes a man a man, and in particular, it's brilliant if you want to get a mate, because it makes you incredibly competitive with your fellow males to find that mate, but it also makes you more attractive to the opposite sex. So having high testosterone makes you an ace data. However, when you then have your child, we really don't need you being distracted by every person who walks past. We need you to focus in on the family. And so that testosterone has to go. Now, in other species that have biparental care, such as other mammals, though they're rare, reptiles and birds, we see this drop in testosterone. We see this shift from priming you to mate to priming you to parent. And we see a drop in testosterone. And we now have very, very strong cross-cultural evidence that this also happens in human males. So looking at populations from, I don't know, Senegal to the Philippines, China to Canada, you know, from the savannas of Africa to the cities of America, we see this drop in testosterone happening in males too. Indeed, recently they did a massive study on 5,000 men and found this drop. Now, we still don't quite understand what the mechanism is that causes this drop to occur. In other, lesser mammals, for example, it's actually smelling the pregnant female. But a study that's been recently done by some colleagues uh, at the University of Stirling in Scotland has found that actually that's not the mechanism in human males, and that's unsurprising. Our, our olfactory area of our brain has reduced massively to enable lots of social cognition to have, have space in our brain. So it's not that. But for example, a lesser ape that has paternal care, the siamang, which is a gorgeous big fluffy gibbon, they actually get the drop in testosterone from interacting with their infants. So we think that might be what's going on in men. But this drop in testosterone is not only a massive advantage in terms of shifting your focus towards your family, but it comes up with two other quite big advantages. Because the lower your testosterone is as a father, the more sensitive a father you are, the more empathetic and keyed into your child's emotional and physical needs. And whilst that drop in testosterone can be a little bit worrying if you're a man, because you sort of think, great, the road to emasculation is becoming a father, actually, there is a massive advantage to that happening. And that's because testosterone blocks the effect of dopamine and oxytocin in your brain. And they're two really great feel-good chemicals. Dopamine is your general reward chemical that makes you feel fabulous. And oxytocin helps you to bond within your social relationships. So by dropping that testosterone, it means that you get a ramped up effect of dopamine and oxytocin just when you need to start building a relationship with this new little human in your life. So that's the first biggie, this drop in testosterone that occurs. Secondly, we see if, as a father, you live with the pregnant partner, we see something rather magical happening between you, and that is that your oxytocin levels come into synchrony. Now, we all exist at different baseline levels of oxytocin, and oxytocin is a really key bonding chemical. It's also a chemical that kind of makes you feel confident in social situations. And the higher your level is, the more confident you are, and, and in some senses, the more sociable you are. But when we see a pregnant uh, woman and her partner interacting, we see this oxytocin coming into synchrony. Now, again, we're not sure of the absolute underlying mechanism. What is causing this? Is it something to do with something the woman's giving off? Is it something to do with touch or physical interaction? We're not sure. But what we do know is that some, it does do an amazing job of bonding that uh, expectant couple together as strongly as possible because they need to go forward and they need to be co-parents. And so evolution has seen fit to give them this, this really strong foundation of the relationship because having a baby is really tough. If anybody's thinking of having one to, I don't know, patch up a relationship, really bad idea because they are incredibly, incredibly stressful. So we need that parenting couple to be as rock solid as they possibly can be. And so that's what we think is going on when these oxytocin levels come into synchrony. Now, and this, is, this uh, phenomenon has been given the very catchy title of biobehavioral synchrony. And so what ultimately we're actually seeing is we're seeing a synchrony in behavior and in physiology, so things like heart rate and body temperature and blood pressure between that couple coming to synchrony, 
and oxytocin levels. And the, the, the person who actually discovered this, who's known as Ruth Feldman, who's in Israel, she is now studying brain activation. And we think probably the brain activations of the parents come into synchrony as well. So this means that they are thinking along the same lines. They are giving attention to the similar things. They're thinking and empathizing in the same way. So it's really critical. And it's also the first message we can see that, do you know what? Parenting actually isn't just about a mum and a baby, but it's actually about a team and a baby. And evolution has seen fit to make sure that team is as strong as it possibly can be. We also see amazing changes in the brain. Now, we've known for, I don't know, maybe five, six years that women undergo quite significant structural brain changes when they become pregnant and when they become mothers. However, the same thing actually happens in men. And these mirror the ones we see in women. So first of all, we see increases in grey and white matter in the very core of the brain. Now, that's where your unconscious mind sits, is where your emotions are. Oh, hello. There we go. Uh, and it's always the technology that gets me every time. Um, oh, it's done it again. There we go. Oh, I think I shouldn't go anywhere near it. Um, imagine there's a brain. And, and the very, very core of the brain is your unconscious, your limbic area. And that's particularly for parenting where nurture and affection and risk detection sit. And that, obviously, those are critical key parenting skills. So we see increases in grey and white matter in those parts of the brain. But we also see increases in the neocortex, so that's the deeply uh, lined outer air of the brain. It looks a little bit like a walnut, and that's where your conscious brain sits, where the higher cognitive abilities sit. Things like planning ahead, problem solving, empathizing, attention all sit in your neocortex, and those are all key parenting skills. So we see an increase in grey and white matter there. But that increase in the neocortex is particularly critical, it's thought, in males who invest in their offspring. Because they haven't gone through the process of pregnancy and childbirth, for them, actually developing that intense bond with the child, being motivated to care for the child, actually occurs in the neocortices. So the fact that we get this increase in grey and white matter in this outer, much younger area of the brain, enables men to build bonds that are just as profound with their children as women do. I'm just going to guess what the next slide is. There we go. OK, imagine there's some DNA up there. Um, <laughs> the next thing is that, that we know that about 20% of fathering is inherited. By doing twin studies, we've looked at the different ways that twins raise their children. About 20% of fathering is inherited. About 80% is actually down to your own upbringing and also the environment in which you exist. If we compare that to mothering, mothering is about 40% uh, um, inherited, and that's going to be quite important later on. But what we do know is there are certain genes that influence the way that you parent, the way that you father. And they do the same thing with mothering as well. And two in particular are linked to the oxytocin system, so that's that key bonding chemical. One is linked to your oxytocin receptor in your brain, so that is the area of your brain onto which oxytocin uh, locks, and we then get those messages going down the axons and through the brain. And the OXTR gene, woo -hoo, Oh, no, I seriously shouldn't touch it. Every time I touch it, it breaks. Um, the, ox the oxytocin receptor gene, or OXTR, is one of these, which... <laughs> um, and that seems to affect not only the density of the receptors in your brain, so actually how many receptors you have, but also how well that message goes down that particular axon. So there are versions of the OXTR gene that make you more sensitive and make you have higher levels of oxytocin. Yay! We might be staring at that for the whole evening. Um, and so some people carry a version of that gene that makes them much more sensitive, much more able to read their baby's emotional needs, much more motivated to actually care for the baby, let's say if the baby is crying. Um, but also actually get a bigger hit of oxytocin from doing so. Then there's another gene that's associated with oxytocin, which is naturally called CD38, and that's involved in the actual production. So that's really um, affecting how high those oxytocin levels are in the first place. And that, and the oxytocin receptor gene, though, unfortunately also have what we call risk versions. And people who carry the risk versions, unfortunately, are more at risk of not being able to parent maybe as sensitively as other people. Um, and it's particularly important for us to recognise these genes and the, fact, the impact they have on oxytocin levels so that we can do work with people who do find it hard to bond with their babies. So a certain element of parenting has a genetic influence to it.
So that was my first conclusion, that if evolution has seen fit to produce this very rare mammalian phenomenon, the investing father, it's going to have prepared dads to do it. And after 10 years of research, we seem to be getting the answers that yes, that's certainly what happened. Men have changes in hormones, men have a genetic underpinning to their parenting, and men undergo structural changes in their brain to enable them to parent. Our second conclusion, though, is that evolution hates redundancy. And what that means is evolution is obsessed by energy and how it distributes that energy within a life course. And it doesn't see fit to make two roles to evolve, which are exactly the same, unless that's actually required for the survival of the child. Now, in our case, we didn't need two parents who did exactly the same thing. So what has happened is actually when we study the roles of men and women, when they parent, we see distinct differences, both in their brain activations, but also in how they actually achieve their role. The first of these is actually what we see in the brain when parents are interacting with their children. So again, here we have another exciting looking brain scan. Um, the little purple bits down the bottom, on the left here we have what's happening in a mother's brain, and on the right here we have what's happening in a father's brain. Now these fMRI scans represent the peaks in activity that occur in a parent's brain when they're watching their child. And in some cases, we do see synchrony between the parents. So men and women, we both see activations within the very core of the brain associated with obviously nature and nurture and affection and risk detection. And we see a little bit of activity synchronous between the two in relation to empathizing, because obviously both parents need to know what their child's needs are so that they can meet them. So that empathizing is important for both. However, when we look at other peaks in activation, we see distinct differences between the two roles. In the mother's brain, the peak in activation actually occurs again within an area in the core of the brain, very much associated with nurturing and affection. And here you can see the amygdala is being highlighted. That's where risk is. So the mother is very aware of detecting risk for her child. However, when we look at the man's brain and he's interacting with his child, we see activation in the neocortices. So if you remembered, I explained that that's also that we see that's quite important in men because they haven't gone through pregnancy and childbirth, that we see this activation in the neocortices. And we see it again, but it's much higher activation than we see in women. And in particular, areas associated with social cognition and also to do with problem solving and planning and particularly looking into the future. Now, just remember that these are peaks in activation. I am not saying that men do not have activation at the core of the brain. They can certainly be affectionate and nurture, and they certainly do detect risk. And women do have activation in the neocortices, but it is the peaks that are different between the two. But so people often say to me, OK, so that's great. So that kid gets a bit of something from the dad, a bit of something from the mum. Entire developmental environment, brilliant. What happens when you don't have a mum and you don't have a dad? What then is, is that child going to suffer in some way? Well, what happens is the most amazing thing, and this shows you the plasticity of the human brain. So a study was done uh, looking at gay fathers, and in particular, primary caretaking gay fathers. So uh, quite a lot of my work I do with gay, gay fathers, uh, and this was a study carried out to see what happened in their brains when they interacted with their children. So if we take the primary caretaking dad, who some might say is filling mum's role, though we don't really like that, but let's call it that, um, we see activation, peaks in activation in both areas of the brain. So we see the peaks in activation in the neocortices, which mirror those we see in heterosexual fathers, and also a peak in the core of the brain that mirrors that we see in heterosexual mothers. But then there is a new neural, neuronal connection between the two, so that those two parenting areas of the brain can communicate with each other, so that that primary caretaking father can create the entire developmental environment for that child. Now, I'm not aware as to whether this study's actually been done in single mothers, so mothers where there isn't a father involved, but we would expect the same thing to happen. The human brain is amazingly adaptable, and it's, you know, ultimately, evolution wants this kid to survive, and this kid to survive and succeed, and therefore the brain changes to enable that to happen. But these differences in, in activation are also seen within the different relationships children form with their parents, between their mum and their dad. And this is known as the attachment. Now, when John Bowlby first suggested attachment in about 1950, he completely denied that fathers had an attachment to their children. Okay? So the only attachment that existed was between mum and baby. And that was the key attachment relationship. And obviously, that attachment relationship was developmentally incredibly important. And the mother was seen, because she was at home, as the entire developmental environment, and the only attachment that mattered was between mum and baby. 
Now, again, coming from a background of, of anthropology, looking at the long evolutionary history of the hominin line, and also simply looking at the dads I know, uh, the idea that a father does not have an attachment to his child, a fundamental, intense, profound relationship with his child, is very difficult to swallow. And we now know that obviously this is not true. But the attachment relationships a child builds with its mother and father are different. They are just as intense and just as profound and just as influential, but they are different. So when we look at a mum's attachment relationship, it is very much based on nurture. And it's quite an exclusive relationship. So it's very much between the two, between the mother and child, and they're very much turned in on each other. So it's an inward-looking relationship. Okay? And it's all about that security, that nurturing security. When we look at dads, that is also based on nurture. So there's very much a nurturing element there, but there is an additional element. And this is really critical to the dad's role, because as well as nurture, there is an element of what we call challenge. So rather than it being an exclusive relationship, inward looking, what we see with fathers is they go, I love you, I nurture you, I am your secure foundation, but now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn you around, I'm gonna go, there's the world, and you need to learn how to deal with it. So fathers, universally, and we, I've studied fathers in many different cultures in the world, absolutely all of them see that as a critical part of their role. I interview many, many fathers, and the number of them who say, I see my role as being, you know, teaching my child to be independent. It's about autonomy. It's about them being able to deal with things. I want them to go out into the world and be a good member of society. And that's ultimately what their aim is, is to say, I am the secure foundation, but I'm going to make you go and explore. You can always come back to me where you are safe, but you need to go. And therefore, the father's role very much is to do that, to, to scaffold his child's entry into the outside world. And we see that in this difference. The other thing that's different about male attachment is the way it's actually created. Now, women do get a head start because they go through particularly childbirth, which is a massive flood of bonding chemicals, which really help that mum have a bit of a head start. We've got oxytocin, we've got dopamine, we've got beta endorphin, which is like, whoa, the opiate of bonding. Um, and that really gets mum fully primed to deal with this baby however little sleep she's had. However, dads don't get that head start. So the way a dad builds his bond is by interacting with his child. But this can mean that there's a little bit of a delay in that bond because human babies, as cute as they are, for the first six months, they don't do a tremendous amount. And if you were looking for a two-way relationship, you aren't going to find it. So there's a little bit of a delay because of the fact we need that two-way interaction to get those chemicals going for that man and that baby so they can start to develop their bond. So actually, when I work with expectant fathers, one of the big things I tell them and prepare them for is, do not expect the massive flood of love you're expecting when it pops out. Because generally that doesn't happen. It will take you a good six months. Most fathers say they feel something when the baby comes out, but that's very much based on genetic relatedness. Oh, yep, that's my baby. Okay. I should love you because you're my baby. Uh, but six months later, it's based on obviously something much more profound, and that is because they've been able to interact. It does start, actually, joking aside, at about three months when baby starts to babble and giggle and smile at you, and you get that, that comeback. But then at six months, once the baby's reached that developmental stage where they can do more, they can start playing with you, for example, at that point, it ramps it up and you get this amazing bond developing. And one of the most critical things a father can do to bond with his baby, and this is again, if fathers say to me, what's the one thing I can do? This is it, is play with your child. Now, there's always a bit of a cliche that dad's the fun parent and mum does all the work. Actually, dads are supposed to play. That's kind of one of their massively important roles, and it's important for two reasons. First of all, <laughs> exactly. First of all, permission to throw child in the air. Um, <coughs> partly because it's really good for bonding, and one form of play in particular is critical, and that is rough and tumble play. Now, rough and tumble play, I think we all know what that means. It's when a dad basically winds a kid up, as we would say in England, until it's just so beyond hysterical, it's unbelievable. But you're throwing it in the air, you're tickling it, you're chasing it around, you're wrestling, you're aeroplaning it around the room. You know, you're both getting completely beyond it, but you are getting a massive flood of neurochemistry, both of you from that. You are getting beta endorphin, because sometimes it's a little bit painful, and beta endorphin is your painkiller, but it's also a great bonding chemical. You're getting dopamine, you're getting oxytocin, you're getting serotonin, it's all kicking off. And because it's particularly quick and particularly exhilarating, you really are getting floods of that happening. And that's happening for the baby and the dad. 
So it's a really, really good bonding behaviour for, for dads and babies. It's also really good, particularly in a time-critical world that we have in the West, where, unfortunately, it's still the case in many societies that dads don't get the opportunity to spend as much time with their children as they might like because of our work structure. It's a really time-efficient way to do it because you can get in there and you can create a really deep bond really, really quickly. So play is important for that reason. But play is also important developmentally to your child. As I mentioned, one of the jobs of a dad is to turn your child to the world and go, you've got to go out there and you've got to survive. And one of the really ways you can do that is by playing with them, because play actually teaches you a lot about social interaction, about dealing with other people, because it's reciprocal. So there's back and forwards. You've got to do that give and take. You've got to try and work out what the person's going to do next. So you have those mentalizing, empathizing skills going on, reading what their intentions are by looking at them. You've got to understand your other partner's boundaries. So, OK, when is this no longer fun? And actually, when is this becoming quite painful? So you need to be able to read that. So it's really, really important that it's one of those skills that starts to teach your child at a very, very young age, everybody's different. And you need to learn to interact with them so that everybody's happy, basically. And play enables you to do that. And what's even more brilliant than that, that you get permission to play, is that children do prefer playing with their dads. And there is a reason for this. And dads prefer playing than changing nappies, but don't we all? Um, it is because we see actually a synchrony and oxytocin release when we see a child playing with his father and a father playing with his child. So if we look at what releases a peak in oxytocin in a parent when we look at different interactions, men get peaks in oxytocin from playing with their children, and women do get peaks in oxytocin from nurturing. So not caring, not doing all the really boring jobs, but giving a hug, for example, smothering and kisses. Women get a peak in that. And if you squirt oxytocin up a parent's nose, which is sometimes what we spend our days doing, um, you will actually increase playful behaviour in fathers and nurturing behaviours in mothers, but not the other way around. And because of biobehavioural synchrony, which obviously we've all heard of earlier, we see, and you've remembered it, we've seen biobehavioural synchrony mean that, again, children actually synchronise their oxytocin releases with their parents, and that means they get the peak from playing with father and the peak from nurturing with mother. So there is a reason why children generally run to mum for a cuddle when they've fallen over, and run to dad when they really, really want to play something. Because that is where the chemical reward is for both parents and child. And therefore, we see that the preferred play partners are fathers and their children. Oh, ooh, excellent. Oh my god, it's steaming. <laughs> excellent, thank you very much. You might, I might just stop talking now, and that might just be it. It could all go very wrong from here on in. Um, so obviously, as I've mentioned with the play, child development is one of the critical roles of fathers. And again, when I started this, it wasn't believed that fathers had any role in child development. You could literally get rid of a dad and it would have absolutely no impact on that child's development at all. Again, how can that possibly be the case? We've had this thing, this very rare thing evolve in our species. And what you're saying that that father therefore has no input into the survival of his child. Of course he does. And that's where child development comes in. And fathers have an input into their child's development throughout their life. But there are two critical points when they are particularly important. And that is when the child is in preschool. So that is when that child is leaving the family home for the first time and going out into the social world, into preschool, into nursery. And as I've said, fathers are about helping the child into the outside world. And that is the first time, really, when a child is going to hit that challenge. And so it's critical for dad to be there then. And in adolescence. So again, when dad is, when the child is mainly moving, again, further away from the family, their peers become more important. They're starting to become adults. Again, at that point, as they step further into the outside world, dad, again, has a particular role in development. Overall, though, Parental sensitivity and a parent's own brain actually influences the structure of the child's brain and also how well they navigate that entry into the world. So, for example, we know that parental sensitivity, so how sensitive you are to your child's needs, how you interact with them, how you reciprocate them, has an absolute direct input on your child's actual brain structure. Because the human brain has to do quite a lot of developing after you're born, if you remember, otherwise we wouldn't get out of the birth canal, um, 
a significant amount of that happens in the first 1,000 days, the first two years of a child's life, and that is influenced greatly by the parenting environment in which they find themselves. So we know that the more sensitive a parent, the greater absolute brain volume a child has, but also the greater neuronal density. So their brain is better wired, it is more efficient at communicating uh, throughout the different neurons. Secondly, we know that a parent's brain density actually impacts how that child navigates the outside world as well. So in three particular areas, what the, the density of grey and white matter in the limbic area, so that's the very core of your brain, that's those emotions and things like fear, detection and love and hate and risk, uh, it affects that. But also the, the outer areas, particularly related to empathising and mentalising, so that's the ability of knowing what someone's going to do next, absolutely critical if you're going to be a social animal. That influences directly how well a child navigates their preschool life. So things like how well a child uh, gets on with other people, so learns how to share, learns how to help or comfort other people. Things like how positive they are on a day-to-day -day basis, how good they are engaging with other people. All these different things, how they control their emotions, are linked to the brain of the actual parents themselves. But specifically looking at fathers, we know that language development is linked directly to the sensitivity and the attachment that a father has to his child. So if we look at how a, a dad fathers at the age of 12 months, so let's say we have a little play experiment going on with the, with the baby and the father, how sensitively the father plays with his child, how good that interaction is, how strong that attachment is, directly influences the extent of child language development at three years because language is our key into the outside world. Being able to, particularly the social languages, are very, very important. Secondly, something known as executive function. Now, executive function is your higher cognitive abilities, the things that sit in the outside area of your brain. They are things like working memory, so that's the ability to actually put things into your memory and remember them and then use them to solve the problems that you're going to hit on a day-to-day -day basis. Attention, really rather important. So how good are you at Attending, for example, to your lesson in school and not being distracted by whatever's happening around here. How good are you at that? That's executive function. And inhibitory control. So we all have urges, but we don't all necessarily display them all the time. And that is executive function. So the ability to know, actually, this emotion or this behaviour right now is not appropriate. So I'm not going to do it. And that is linked to executive function. And we know that fathers, again, have a distinct influence on this, particularly around the age of two years. They, they, only they, not mums, only they at the age of two years have a very strong influence on how well that baby's executive function actually operates. And executive function is key to navigating your way around the wider world. And then if we go and look at adolescence, obviously one of the big things, particularly in the UK where, where I work at the moment, is a discussion about mental health in adolescence. I don't know whether it's the same here um, in the Netherlands, but yes, yeah, certainly here it's, uh, in the UK it's a big thing. And what we're finding, actually, increasingly, is that while both parents have an input into their child's mental health, particularly during adolescence, dads seem to have a particular role. Now, we think that that's probably to do with the fact that a lot of the issues that adolescents have around mental health, around anxiety and depression, are linked to their interactions with the wider world. So it could be social anxiety, it can do with, for example, eating disorders associated with looking at too many perfect people on Instagram, whatever it might be, but they operate within the social world. And because it's dad that is underpinning your entry into the social world, he is the one that has the greater influence on how good your mental health is going to be. So you have a secure attachment to your dad, you are much more likely to have good mental health as you go forward. And this has been replicated in, in several countries now, and we know there's a direct link between the strength of the attachment and, for example, the risk of depression, having high self-esteem, and also how lonely you feel. And there's been a recent study done, a really, really good study, actually looking at how the sorts of things that a father can do with their child to actually help them in terms of their mental health. And what's really important with fathers and children are two things. First of all, how important your teenager thinks they are to you. This seems to be more critical when we're talking about the relationship between teenagers and fathers than teenagers and mothers. So how important your child feels they are to you as a father impacts directly on how good their self-esteem is. Secondly, 
being a dad, what's most important during this age period is interaction, is doing things with your father. There's been a great study recently that's been done amongst a longitudinal study that started with a group of, of teenagers, looked at the sort of interactions that they did with their dad, how often they did them, and then looked at their mental health in adulthood, and particularly how good they were at dealing with stress and their cortisol levels, cortisol being the stress hormone. And again, there is a direct relationship between the sorts of interactions they did as a child, how often they did those interactions with their father, and how good they are at dealing with stress, and how high or low their cortisol levels are as an adult. And this is partly because children have this belief, we're not sure where it comes from, that affection during teenagehood from your mom is still represented by a good hug. But for your dad, it's actually what your dad does with you. It's your dad giving time to you. And therefore, what I say to the fathers of teenagers is, it's about doing something with it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It can be cooking lunch, taking the dog for a walk, going on a bike ride, washing the car, whatever it might be. But you're doing things together. That makes them feel important. That raises their self-esteem. And that gives them a good protective armor against future mental health problems. And just finally, I want to talk about fatherhood around the world. Because as I said, we study fatherhood around the world, and the one thing you notice about the fathering role is it's incredibly flexible. Much more flexible than the mum's role. So actually, when we look at how people achieve fathering around the world, there are so many different ways of doing it. Now, they all have that, that central foundation of being about challenging development, showing the child how to go into the world, teaching them the skills to do that, but they achieve that in many different ways. And one of the reasons they can do that is men's roles are much less bound by the biology of being a parent, because you don't do pregnancy and you don't do childbirth, so you have more leeway, to be honest. Um, that's a really, really good thing, because that means that dad is the parent who can quickly change their role in response to environmental change. They are the parent who has to shift and go, OK, I'm not doing that role now, I'm doing this role now, because the environment has changed and I need to shift what's important. And that's what dads seem to do around the world. So how a role develops in a different environment actually seems to be down to the level of risk. So what's important to a father in terms of what his role should be is down to the risk within the environment. And this was put together by an anthropologist known as Robert Devine. And for example, if we're in a high-risk environment, so here we're talking about actual threats to physical life. Someone or something is trying to kill your child, whether it be uh, some sort of disease or whether it, in fact, be that lion standing there. Okay. In a high-risk environment, you as a father, your primary concern is the physical survival of your child. So if we're looking in from the outside in the West, where it's all quite cosy comparatively, and we go, God, he's not a very good father, you know, never interacts with his child, never, you know, feeds them, provisions them, gives them a hug. But that is because he is literally fighting on a day-by-day -day basis to protect his child's life. And ultimately, that is the most important thing. So he is being a good father in that environment. For example, an example of that is the Aceh in South America, a very warlike group of people. They like raiding each other's villages. In that environment, dads literally spend very little time with their children, but they know that if they die, that child has a very high chance of being killed and therefore they protect it with their life. Medium risk environments, those are environments where it's not necessarily a physical risk, but there is an economic risk. So environments where it's a pretty tough economic climate, uh, quite a lot of these, for example, in Africa, the Kipsigis or a Kenyan tribe, and there it's about teaching your child how to economically survive. So again, it's not about, oh, taking them to museums and making sure they've got nice after-school clubs and all that kind of thing. It's about, okay, this is how we earn our money, these are the skills you need to know how to earn our money. This is how we farm. This is how we negotiate a good deal. Uh, this is how you build the social relationships to make sure you have the trading relationships. And then the low-risk environment. So that's where eco the economy is OK. There's not really any particular physical risk. At that point, as a father, you can shift your role to thinking of wider, longer-term futures for your child. So what's important here? Education. Uh, having the right social connections, because in a lot of the West, it's who you know that's going to get you on in life. So it's more about focusing on that. And there it is things like, you know, making sure they have the right after-school clubs, helping them do their homework, getting them the right internship. And that's what a father will focus on. It's much more about the social and cultural education of his child. And finally, what I want to make very clear is when I talk about fathers, I am not necessarily talking about the biological father of that child. Because again, by studying fathers around the world, it's very, very clear to me that a dad is not necessarily the person who shares genes with their child, it's who steps up and does the job. 
And in many environments, it's not the biological father. For whatever reason, economically, the biological father might have to work away. That's certainly what happens in a lot of South African um, families where the grandfather raises the child. It could be that actually culturally, because of, for example, matrilineal or whatever it might be, we don't want the biological dad on the scene because he'll nick all the power, and therefore the uncle will be the father. Because the fathering role is actually very culturally tied. And actually, here in the West, whilst we still put the biological father on a pedestal, if we look at a lot of the fathers we know, they're actually what we call social fathers. They're stepfathers, they're adoptive fathers. I work with a lot of gay fathers. Sometimes one gay father is the biological father, but the other one certainly isn't. Okay? Or it could be a grandfather, an uncle, a teacher. Some lucky kids get whole teams of fathers. And every, those people get to be called dads. So when I'm talking about fatherhood, that is what I'm talking about. And what's very clear is these biological changes they happen in non-biological fathers as well. They happen in adoptive fathers. We saw what happened in the gay father's brain. That gay father wasn't biologically related to that child. Okay, so we need to remember that actually, and, and open the, the view of what a father actually is. A father is somebody who steps up and does the job. So just to, to remind you what I've said, human fathers are rare. And that's what makes them so important. They evolve for a very particular reason. And because of that, they are biologically and psychologically primed to parent. We're not going to leave this to chance. We're not going to evolve something so rare and go, hey, you're on your own. And mum and dad have evolved to take on different roles because that's, that's because we want to be efficient about using these roles. We want to make sure the child has the full developmental environment. They universally, regardless of what culture we look, we look in, have a role in scaffolding their child's entry into the world beyond the family. And their attachment relationship is based upon that, on the idea of challenge. Dad's role is hugely flexible and is influenced by the level of risk, okay? And dads are not defined by genetic relatedness to their child. The one joy of the human brain, of the human species, is our ability to attach, to love, and to evolve, to look after a child that's not genetically related to us. And that's a huge power of our species. So I want to say thank you very much for listening. You've been great. Uh, I have got a book, obviously. Um, there are copies to sell out there. They are at a discount rate tonight, by the way. Um, but if you, have, if you want to know more about the research we do at Oxford, about fathers, about where we're going next with our research, then it's all on my website, uh, or you can follow me on Twitter. And, f and on my website, there's a contact form. So if you haven't got time to ask a question tonight or don't want to in front of a room of people, then feel free to email me, and I will email you back. Thank you very much. Thank you.